Okay, I've listened to you guys and I know you want to take some really deep dives. So today we're going to make one of my favorite and most accessible moles, mole coloradito. Let's talk coloradito, mole coloradito. It's one of the seven moles of Oaxaca and it is absolutely one of my favorites. It's not the big ordeal of making black mole, which is a wondrous thing. It's not as simple as say making the yellow mole, but it has the complexity of a red mole that I, I honestly, it will become one of your absolute favorites. You may turn away from all other moles once you make this one and just go to it. It's known for having a really strong red chili presence and a nice amount of chocolate. It's one of the few moles where the chocolate actually is a bigger player. Most moles have chocolate in them just as one of the spices to make a little more complexity. So this is kind of an interesting one. I Most of the time when you go to Oaxaca, you will see it on every restaurant menu as the sauce for enchiladas. And I love it that way. Um, you could also use it as a sauce for say grilled swordfish or pork or chicken. Um, all of those things go beautifully with mole coloradito. Today I'm going to show you this Linton dish that is popular in Oaxaca, which is made with beans, but not just any beans. It's made with runner beans or what they call ayocotes or frijolones in Mexico. So this particular bean is way bigger than a regular bean. Now this is sort of, it's in the same general category, the Faziolas uh, group of, of beans but it's off to the side. And in Europe, growing this runner bean is super popular, but not for food. They love the way it looks. So when you grow, it's a vining thing, and then you grow it up on a big tripod, say, it will have the most gorgeous red flowers. So you might want to think about growing runner beans in your garden, but then take it to the next step like they do in Mexico. They harvest a lot of those blossoms and they will scramble them into eggs. They will make a simple taco filling out of them. And so you get both things. You get the bean and you will get the use of the flowers, which I think is really spectacular. Now, the one thing that I have to tell you about runner beans, and they come in many different colors. The most popular one is called scarlet runner beans, and they're more purple color than this. These are black runner beans, and I particularly love the flavor of them. This is what we use in our restaurant a lot, but they take a long, long time to cook. So instead of cooking in, say, one and a half hours, like regular beans, like black beans or kidney beans would do, these are going to take about three hours, three and a half hours. So here's my recommendation to you. Put them into your slow cooker and cook them all day long in your slow cooker. It's the perfect temperature. You don't have to worry about them scorching. You don't have to add more water to them. Do that. That's not what I have done. I've already cooked them over here. And so I'm going to grab the top off of this and just make sure that I've got a bare simmer on these going right now. Um, and that means to me that it's gonna be around 190 to 200 degrees. Um, it's not at a boil. That's 212 degrees, it's below that. 190 is what most of the slow cookers work at. So you just keep it at a very low simmer if you're working on stovetop. So that's the bean part of this. And you may just want to be able to, to make it this way or make the sauce separately, which I'm going to show you exactly how to do right now. So the first thing that we have to talk about is the dried chilies that go into this sauce here. Um, and I have anchos and guajillos in front of me. And it's usually a combination of that. The sweetness uh, comes from the anchos. The brightness comes from the guajillo chilies. Um, you always want to make sure that you get the, the, the chilies that are flexible. This one didn't have a stem on it, this first one that I'm opening up here, but you simply open them up, let the seeds fall out. You want to get most of the seeds out, but you don't have to be meticulous about that. Um, I'll do one of the guajillos before I go into the whole thing. I like to just rip them open like this and let the seeds fall out of them. Now the guajillos are obviously the real smooth skinned and the anchos are a wrinkled skin chili with a lot more flesh on it. 
Um, and that's all we want to do except to tear them into flat pieces so that we can toast them, which will be our next step. Okay, now on to the toasting. It's a standard toasting. You guys have seen me do this a lot. I have my pan here over kind of medium heat and I'm gonna press down on these pieces of chili. I, this is the standard way that I do it. Other people do it in different ways, um, but I kind of like to toast all of the chilies very evenly. Usually put, putting them the um, inside down so that I can see if they've gotten toasted enough when I flip them because they will change color on the inside. So let's just look at this. It doesn't take very many seconds, but it's a, a lighter brown, chocolatey brown color in there, not the really dark there. So it doesn't take more than just a few, if you've got the heat right, it doesn't take too many more than just a few seconds of pressing them down to get them evenly toasted. And let's see what these guys look like here. I can smell that they're, they're ready to be flipped much lighter color on the inside there give them a press now I'm just going to go through and toast all of these chilies this is an essential part of making the right flavor in this mole if you don't toast the chilies it won't have the depth of flavor my last little pieces are toasted here and I need to cover them with hot tap water. So just straight out of the top, you don't have to boil the water. I, I think that if you've got good hot tap, tap water, that's what you should use. Um, I like to put a little plate on top of them to keep them submerged so that they rehydrate evenly. And we will let those sit there for about 20, 30 minutes until they're completely rehydrated. Back to our, our pan that is still over kind of medium heat, but some of the chili seeds have come off in there. So I'm just gonna put those right over here in the sink. And now we're gonna toast the sesame seeds. Some recipes, some cooks in Oaxaca will use a combination of sesame seeds and other things, most typically almonds in this one. I've made this as a simple mole coloradito recipe um, with a focus on just one of the nut slash seed thickeners. We'll do the toasting of it. Maybe you have toasted sesame seeds because you do a lot of Asian cooking and you can buy already toasted sesame seeds. But if you don't have those on hand, you'll take your regular untoasted sesame seeds and just stir them for several minutes until they're a uniformly golden color. I like to just kind of toss them in the pan as I'm going like that. You may feel comfortable doing that or stir them with a spoon, but they're already starting to turn golden. It smells super good. I love that smell of toasting sesame seeds. They're going to go straight into the blender jar here. Put all of them down in there. Pan will go back onto the medium heat. And this time we're going to lay on a piece of foil. You don't have to do this. I'm working in a nonstick skillet, but I usually will lay on a piece of foil for easy cleanup. So then I don't have to scrub my nonstick skillet, but um, whatever works for you. Um, I'm just gonna slice this onion into about quarter inch slices and then lay them on the on this foil here in a single layer and we're going to roast them this is a very very common thing that you'll see Oaxacan cooks doing is to roast the onion um, and sometimes they'll roast them whole um, but it goes much faster if you will roast the slices just lay them out there and it's kind of a willy-nilly thing you don't have to be very careful about this stuff because we want to get a little char because we're not we're roasting with no oil here you'll notice and then I'm going to make room also for some garlic cloves still in their skins and we're going to roast all of this until the onion is gotten some nice little darkness to it. I wouldn't necessarily call it a, all the way to a like char, but it's gonna be completely soft. And then we'll notice that the, about the same amount of time for these garlic cloves to get soft on the inside. 
this is what they look like when they're done right, I think. Um, and I now that's cooled off a little bit, can peel off the little papery skins on the, the garlic. I usually start at the, the root end of the garlic because it gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of peeling back, so like that. And then um, we are gonna combine all of this with the sesame seeds that we just, just did our toasting on here. And we're gonna add all the rest of the non-chili things to this blender. So we've got all that garlic going in there. Then all of the roasted onions. I've got a can of fire roasted tomatoes, which in Oaxaca would not come in a can. This is something that people would actually do the roasting of, but when they're at ready access and decent quality, this is what I'm going to put in here. And then we've got raisins. The mole coloradito almost always has some sort of dried fruit, like many of the red chili moles do. And sometimes people will put a piece of plantain. That is harder for most people in the United States to lay their hands on because you can't just go to the grocery store and find ripe plantains always available. So I've written this recipe uh, to just call for the raisins. And then we've got the spices that are gonna go in here as well. I have already, I, I usually keep a little jar of Mexican cinnamon that I've pulverized myself. And of course the, the uh, black pepper and the Mexican Mexican oregano. This is always a dish that has sweet spices in it. Um, you could put a little bit of cloves in here if you wanted to, or some allspice. There are a number of cooks in Oaxaca that will put those things into their mole coloradito. I'm just crushing it all together, even though that cinnamon is already ground. Just be, I, I use the ground cinnamon because I like to do that in my electric spice mill. I can do it here. It just takes a lot of elbow grease. But so we've got some of the, the sweet spice flavor coming from that cinnamon, and that'll go into the blender jar as well. And we'll make a smooth, smooth puree out of this, which is gonna take a little bit of time, only because of the sesame seeds that are in here. Okay, this is smooth now. Um, I let it run for several minutes. Uh, if you don't have a high speed blender like this, it's gonna probably take you four, four minutes or so uh, to do it. And you'll notice that making of the mole coloradito follows the traditional steps of making any kind of red chili mole. Um, and we have now blended everything but the chili mixture. And to ensure that it is smooth, that we don't get chunks of the unblended stuff, mostly sesame seeds in there. I'm gonna press it through a medium mesh sieve, not a, a fine sieve here. Um, but I'm not washing the blender jar because I'm gonna just go straight into the blending of the chilies with that. So I'll press all of this through the, this strainer. Okay, so there's just very little left here in this, the, the strainer. That's mostly just the holes of the sesame seeds. So I'm gonna put that down here in my compost bowl, make sure that I get every little bit of it off the exterior of the strainer. And then I'm just gonna set this over here to the side. Now we need to get the pan hot that we're going to be cooking in. And today I'm using a special pan that I wanted to talk about. This is stovetop ceramic, and maybe some of you have seen it or have some pieces of it. I think it's really a wonderful thing to cook in because it's very similar to the earthenware that a traditional mole would be cooked in in Mexico. You don't have this, don't worry. You can cook it in any kind of a pot that's about this same size. You wanna have about eight to 10 inches across. That's really important so that there's a lot of room at the bottom for the chili puree, which will come in next to sear and reduce quickly. Um, so I'm gonna say about 10 inches is gonna be the right thing. But if you have a cast iron enamel coated Dutch oven, that works perfectly well. But you could also just do it in a stainless 
stainless steel pan if you have one that is wide. So there's lots of different choices here, but I'm going to put this one now over about a medium high heat because I want to make sure that it gets hot before we add the chili to it. While that heats, I'm going to puree the chilies now. So they've soaked for about a half an hour at this point. And again, without washing the the blender jar. It's all going to go into the same pot eventually. I'll take the plate off the top and use a pair of tongs to transfer these into the blender jar. And they'll have completely rehydrated and sort of look like their fresh state when right before they went into the drying process. And then I'm going to add about a cup full of this soaking liquid. Um, sometimes I ask you to taste the soaking liquid and um, determine whether it's very bitter or not. It's a small amount in this recipe, so I'm just going to go for it as a medium for blending these chilies. Now you notice that I was just eyeing that. I, I'm trying to get just the right amount of the liquid to allow the chilies to go through the blender blades. That's all I'm looking for. If you're sort of stall in the middle of all of this, then I suggest you just add a little bit more of the soaking liquid until you get it everything moving through the blades. Okay, so that blended, I know it's going to be completely smooth, but we are still going to strain it to make sure that all the chili skins got, got very well blended into it. Um, my pan is hot now, and I'm going to film it with a little bit of olive oil. Now, that may sound surprising, because usually when I'm doing really traditional dishes, I will go for the high-rendered pork fat, the lard, um, to do this, but I'm making this dish all vegetarian today because this is a Lenten dish, the one with the runner beans that are simmering away in the pot next to me here. Um, and so I'm going to show you how to do that because I know a lot of you cook for vegetarians or even vegans. This is a perfect kind of a dish for that. So I have now filmed the bottom of this pot uh, with enough oil to cover it. And I'm going to set the strainer over the pot here. Um, and push through all of this chili puree. So that'll just go into, you can just scrape it all in. And you notice how much there is here. It's actually a little more chili puree than the vegetable puree with the sesame seeds in it. So this is a, um, a mole that is heavy on the chilies. Okay, so that's all there. Now, as we press it through, you should hear a crackle as the chili itself starts to hit the hot oil. Okay, so now I've done a, a very good job of blending because there's not very much left in the strainer at all. Just a little bit of chili skin here. And I'm going to put that over here because we're going to wash all this up now and stand here for, I don't know, seven or eight minutes. As this sears and cooks down, it'll darken in color, and we want it to cook down to the consistency of tomato paste. So we can't rush this step. This is one of the most important steps for bringing out sweetness, pushing back the natural astringency of the chili, and giving it a really rich and resonant flavor. A lot of stirring to get this to the right stage, but I've gotten it to that stage now. I'm using the test of drawing my spatula through it, um, and you can see how it doesn't immediately run to fill it in. It eventually does run to fill it in, but it's really thick now, um, and that's what we're looking for, that kind of reduced thickness. And our next step is then to add the final two ingredients. I'm going to put in three cups of vegetable broth because that's what I'm working with here as a vegetarian kind of dish. And then I'm going to add chocolate to it. And 
the chocolate that I am going to add to it, let me just get this stirred in here first. Um, yeah, this is going to be just exactly right here. Um, and this is going to need some simmering time. I highly recommend if you're going to make the mole coloradito, make it the day before because the flavor just gets so much better as it sits overnight. All the things come together in a really beautiful way, which is, I keep emphasizing everything coming together because mole is not about one flavor. It's about the combination of many different flavors that create a unique flavor. So I've got some chopped up Mexican chocolate here. It doesn't look like what you would find in a grocery store because there you'll usually find tablets of the chocolate. What I brought to use in this is what we do in our restaurant. And we actually bring in uh, cacao beans from Mexico, fully fermented cacao beans from Mexico, and we grind them to a paste and then we add sugar to that. Um, so it makes a hot chocolate mix already ready for you to go. It doesn't, we never form it into the discs or anything. So I'm using that chocolate, which is like my favorite Mexican chocolate in the whole wide world because it's got a high uh, cocoa butter, I mean, it has a high cacao content to it. Um, this one is probably right at about 60%, so it's going to taste very chocolatey. Now, turn the temperature down on this to medium-low. Um, I'm going to re recommend that you cover it but only partially cover it, allow a little bit of steam to escape like that, and let it go for a minimum of 30 minutes, but It'll really benefit by a couple of hours of simmering if you have that much time to devote to it. And then we will come back and we will season it and we're ready to finish the dish. I just wish there was some way to share how good this smells <laughs> with all of you because you would be making your shopping list right away. Okay, first things first, we got to get some seasonings right in here. No, let's, I'm, I meant to say we're going to put the beans in there because that's going to change the seasonings just a little bit. Um, so um, I cooked these beans uh, with just a little bit of uh, salt in with them so that they could get that beautiful saltiness all through them. And then I'm just going to use a slotted spoon to put them all in here. I don't want the bean broth to go in. Okay, I didn't tell you how to determine if these beans are done. I, I think that's actually something that we should talk about, especially since I say that these take a really long time to cook. Um, so I'm going to take one of the beans, and when I put it in my mouth, I want absolutely no grittiness. I want creaminess. And these, because of their tough skins, um, just take a really long time to get completely tender. The stage before this, they'll feel almost tender, but at the same time, you'll notice the skin's texture and you will notice a slight grittiness on your palate. So just keep simmering them away, okay? So I'm gonna stir them in now and then we'll do our taste and season, final seasoning here. So I always recommend to everyone that you taste your food before you add any seasonings because I will tell you that there is some salt in that broth and there is some sugar in the chocolate that I put in here. So I kind of know where I'm starting. That's really, really, really important. Um, this will take um, a couple of teaspoons of salt because obviously we're making a lot of it. And having made this a bunch, I will say that I'm going to start with that. I maybe is not exactly where I'm going to end, but I'm going to start with the two teaspoons of salt. Get that completely distributed through it. And then I'm going to go back and taste again. Now I know that all those flavors, the savory flavors, all just came together. Everything seems like it's in balance, but the chili itself is hiding. So when you're talking about uh, chilies, they are a dried fruit and just a hint of sugar will bring out their natural fruitiness. So I'm gonna start with a teaspoon. Again, that may not be where I, I end up, though I hit the mark with the 
the first seasoning. And let's taste this one with just that little hint of sugar. Now, there, there's already some sugar in here, so we don't want to make it taste sweet. We want to just make the chili flavor come forward. And it did. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened there. I'm turning off the fire because I have a really beautiful uh, vessel to serve this in. I could just set this on the table like this and let everybody help themselves. But since it's such a rustic dish, I thought I would just lead you all through a, a portion serving of it because I think that you're going to see that it can be done. This can be a, something that you can do in a really beautiful, beautiful way. So I'm going to put spoon some into an earthenware bowl. This, by the way, is regular market pottery that you can buy in Oaxaca. That's where I bought this. And I am going to scoop up some of our lovely ayocote beans in red mole. And then I will put on it a little bit of toasted sesame seeds here. Sprinkle those over the top. And for those of you that like to do a lot of different kind of cooking, you may know these crispy fried shallots that they sell in the Asian grocery stores. They're super popular for Thai cooking. Um, it's not, they're not hard to make, but when you can buy them and they're just really uh, add a delicious crunch to the dish. And of course, anything in that onion fam family would be just absolutely wonderfully welcome here. You get a different texture, a different flavor that's adding something really beautiful to it. So it's not a very traditional <laughs> garnish for ayocotes in Coloradito, but it's a really delicious one. And I think you would have fun doing that or some other kind of little crispy onion thing to go on the top. It's an adventure to make mole coloradito, whether you're gonna just make the sauce and use it for enchiladas or to go on some grilled food, or you're gonna make this Lenten dish with the big, beautiful runner beans. You're gonna love making coloradito.